Morning, Victoria. Good morning, Randy. Sounds like people are still dinging in, so we'll give another minute or two. Should we get started? 
I think so. Oh, somebody else just joined. <laughs> All right, another 30 seconds. Because <laughs> so we have a lot of stuff to cover. Okay, well, I'm going to get started. Welcome everyone to our second town hall meeting um, hosted by the medical leadership team of uh, Keystone. Um, there's a lot of stuff to cover, a lot of questions to be answered. Uh, this is kind of a dark subject. This is not a feel good talk, uh, unfortunately. Um, and I will tell you that there's no shaming, no arm twisting, well, maybe a little. But there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of bad information out there, and there's a lot of good information out there. And what we're trying to do is separate the, the good and reliable information from the information that doesn't have really good sources. If we can move some of the people who are hesitant to get the vaccines and get them off the fence on the side of getting the vaccine. Even if we can move one person, it's worth it. And if we can crack the resolve of some of the people that are adamant about not getting the vaccine, then it's worth it. A couple of other things, uh, just yesterday, two, two news items. Um, in New York State, the governor has now mandated that all healthcare professionals uh, seeing patients need to be vaccinated. So it's a vaccine mandate in New York State. And as you in Texas know, the Texas governor has uh, contracted COVID. Fortunately for him, he's been vaccinated and he is uh, able to work, continue to work and govern the state. Um, our panel is, of course, myself, Dr. Elizabeth James, Dr. Gerald Gorman, Dr. Hadam Murad, Dawn Patterson, our Director of Advanced Practice Providers. Um, and I would like, before we do anything else, I would like to invite our frontline providers to give their, their perspective on the COVID uh, pandemic and the COVID uh, vaccines. And uh, I don't know, uh, we'll start with in this order, Dr. Murad, would you like to take the first shot? Sure, Dr. Glantz. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here <clears throat> and uh, carving out this much time of your day for such an important topic. Um, it is, uh, it is with a heavy heart that I say that we never thought we would be back in this uh, situation. Um, turning on my camera so that you guys can see me. So, uh, so here we are, and, uh, and I don't know which wave of the pandemic this counts as, but, um, but we're all very overwhelmed and over, uh, overburdened and swamped. And, um, and it's a difficult time. It's a difficult time because we really thought that we had uh, gotten past this. And so to slip backwards um, is, uh, is heavy. And we, and we are back at a, at a point um, that's worse than what we thought was the worst that we've had. Our, uh, our numbers have grown exponentially since, uh, since around the beginning of July. And, and we don't see kind of a light at the end of the tunnel yet. Uh, we know that the disease um, is a little bit different in that it's affecting younger patients. Uh, there's some theories on that that we can also talk about. Um, the biggest one is that a lot of the older population is already vaccinated. So that's, you know, that's a big part of that. I guess that's part of what we're gonna talk about today. I think, um, I think we're seeing some really bad outcomes for some very young folks, and we don't have the ability to make sense of that. That's not what we're used to in medicine, and uh, and that makes this a very emotional 
uh, situation for a lot of us. Um, if you if you are not scared, um, then it's probably because you haven't seen what we've seen. Because those of us who are doing it are scared. Uh, those of us who are vaccinated are scared. So I can't imagine what those who aren't vaccinated must feel like. Um, in uh, at Anderson, we have uh, over twenty three or 24 patients in the ICU that have COVID that are on the ventilator. And we have uh, more than that on the floor that are requiring lots of oxygen and could essentially be moved to the ICU at any point. Um, I worked at Gulfport last week. It was a similar situation of COVID patients um, really everywhere. And, and I really mean everywhere, like in the halls, in the emergency room on stretchers, um, it's it's just as bad as it sounds, and it's just as bad as it looks on the television. And if there's anything that we can do to keep this from happening and keep this from getting worse, then we're fully committed to doing that in whatever way that is. Thanks, Dr. Murad. Dawn, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure, sure, Dr. Glantz. Hi, everybody. Um, you guys know that I usually try to be the cheerleader of the group, and I usually try to keep things as light and positive as I can. And I have to, I have to echo Dr. Murad. It's real dark right now. Um, I've just come off of a string of shifts, and. Um, yeah, things are things are as bad in Mississippi as like Dr. Murad says, as you're seeing on the television. Um, a, a lot of it is that we're down nursing staff, like everywhere. I mean, everywhere short nurses. Um, UMC, um, I'm sure you guys have seen in the headlines, which is where I trained. Uh, my nurse practitioner program was at UMC. Um, the biggest hospital system we have in the state has had to reach out for help. And we, it yesterday opened its second um, medical unit in a parking lot, a parking garage um, within days of each other. Now, I, I, Melissa's asked me to explain the reason it's in the parking garage isn't that we don't have enough beds. We, we have beds, we don't have enough nurses. And apparently there's some kind of a federal glitch that if they send help, it can't go into like a private institution. So that's why they've chosen the parking lot. But I think it's important to remember that, you know, having trained there and spent years there, this is the parking lot where the homeless used to go to the bathroom in the corners. And now it's an ICU and there are two units there. Uh, Marion, my small hometown hospital, Mayberry, uh, is full. Uh, yesterday, I actually got a call from Baytown, Texas, an ER trying to transfer three um, COVID patients, they had called everywhere, and I, I sent them to our medcom, and I'm hoping they were able to help them. Dr. Murad's right. This, this is different. It is younger people, and the senselessness and, and, and the helplessness uh, I, I shared with Dr. James and, and my team yesterday, I, I'm a worker. I'm not afraid of work. I'm not afraid of hard work. I've done that all my life. If I've got sick patients, I will go 16 hours without eating. I have to stop for a bathroom break, but I'm, I've done that because, you know, every, one, of the, one of the arguments, and I'm going to throw this out here and, and maybe professionally I shouldn't, but personally I feel led that I need to. One of the things out there is, you know, God's in control and God's going to protect us. And I, I believe in that. I'm, I'm a religious person. I believe that I am where God has me be. And that's why I can do the 16 hours and I can do all these days because I feel like he has me in a position to use me, but God also gave me good sense. I know to get out of the rain. I know not to walk in front of a car. There are natural laws that should I use my free will uh, and make the wrong decision, I suffer those consequences. Um, I have to believe that, that science is, is, is innately good and that we try to get good things out of science and that we should take, um, really a serious look at when, when science gives us a way to protect ourselves, just like building homes protects us from the rain. 
Um, but I was with this lady yesterday and this, and Mirad's right. This is what really gets you. She's 44 years old. She is not overweight. She is not a smoker. She has no health problems whatsoever. On six liters of oxygen, this lady can't roll over off her belly on the stretcher without her oxygen sat going really, really low. And she's seen enough news that she's scared. And she's naturally upset. And I'm scared for her because I can't really do anything. Um, and I'm a fixer. <laughs> you know, in the ER, we fix them enough that they get to somebody else like Dr. Bravada and he does his magic and gets them home. But, you know, I'm a fixer and I can't fix. And it is dark. And no matter how positive that you try to be, it's hard to deal with. And um, it is worse than it's ever been for me personally. Um, that's what I'm seeing. And I have to hope for better days. So that's where I am. Thanks, Don. Jerry Gorman. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I guess from my perspective, I'll go through kind of what we're experiencing now, which is basically, thankfully, nothing, nothing much anyways. We really went through the horrors of it during, during the winter. Um, and that may have kind of helped us kind of convince people and the community to get vaccinated. Um, you know, we're obviously up in uh, upstate New York. Uh, we are seeing an increase of cases that uh, the counties have kind of sequenced what we're seeing. And it's almost exclusively, I think 99% is the Delta variant or in the high 90s, it's all the Delta variant. But thankfully, we have a very high rate of vaccination and a very, in a reasonably high rate of natural immunity um, so that we've had, we're not experiencing anything close to what uh, regrettably you guys are all suffering down in Mississippi and Florida, Texas. Um, to give you a frame of reference, the, um, at Niagara Falls, we have three COVID patients hospitalized now. Um, and, you know, if you went back to January, we had our entire ICU was COVID patients. Um, our COVID floor, you probably had about another 20, um, basically occupying all of our acute beds. Uh, we have three patients, none of them are intubated, two are on the floor, one is in the ICU on some supplemental oxygen. Uh, in the rest of the community, there's, I think, about 78 hospitalized in all of uh, Buffalo, the Southern tier uh, and so forth. Obviously those numbers can and may, may change, but I think if anything, our experience is kind of helpful to demonstrate the utility and the usefulness of vaccination. So uh, what we've had, and if you look around the world, you see this too, that you've had this uncoupling of cases and hospitalizations because of the vaccines. So even though the cases are going up, the, the people who are hospitalized have really stayed small. So that's, that's a tribute to uh, the vaccines and it demonstrates how well they've really been working. So um, I'm hoping we kind of keep this path. Um, again, and this is with the Delta variant that everyone's heard so much about. Uh, we really have not seen um, what what you guys are all unfortunately seeing down down south. So we're hoping it stays that way. It's been going like this for about a month where cases are continuing to increase, 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 but the number of hospitalizations aren't. And I would say 99% um, of those hospitalized are unvaccinated. So uh, I know the, the one unvaccinated patient we had, or I'm sorry, the one vaccinated patient we had admitted in Niagara Falls was a guy who had an infected wound 
who had no signs or symptoms of COVID was vaccinated, but to go to the OR, they just incidentally did a test and he tested positive, but he had no symptoms. So that was the only vaccinated patient we've had that, that's, uh, that's been admitted. So uh, maybe this testament will help convince some people who are on the fence that it, it really demonstrates that yes, the vaccinations are working and uh, are doing what they're supposed to do, keeping people from getting very ill. Um, and that's what we want them to do. And thankfully here, we've, we've experienced that firsthand. Thank you, Jerry. Yep. Um, next, we're going to have a moment of silence for all the friends and family lost due to COVID-19. And next, I would like to ask Melissa Jackson to, uh, to step up to the microphone. Um, I am just totally blown away by her willingness and um, uh, to speak about the subject she requested to speak to you guys. And so, Melissa, uh, the floor is yours. OK, can you hear me? Yes. OK. So just to give everybody context before I start, I wrote this on August 8th, uh, which was the day that I lost my husband. <clears throat> this is the hardest thing I've ever typed, but it's reality. I'm going to share this with hope in my heart that somebody will read it, understand the reality of this incredibly dangerous virus and get vaccinated in memory of my precious Jeff Jackson. We both started feeling sick last weekend and I called our primary doctor. We did a telehealth visit Tuesday afternoon and the doctor immediately started treating us for COVID. They started us both on iver ivermectin and also gave Jeff a Z-pack. We started taking vitamin C, D3, and zinc. We went and got te tested Wednesday and both confirmed positive. Jeff ran a high fever on and off all week. He laid in bed most of the time and slept a lot. I would put my foot down and make him get up, move around as much as he could, even only at even if only a walk to his recliner because I was worried about a blood clot or pneumonia setting in. He couldn't eat hardly anything all week. If he tried, he would cough so hard and then he'd start choking and vomiting. This is reality. On Thursday evening, I noticed he would grab his chest when he coughed, so I asked him why and he said, because it hurts. I used a pulse ox to check his saturated oxygen. That's the oxygen in your red blood cells. And it was 85, 95 to 99 is normal. He agreed to let me call 911 Friday morning after I checked the pulse ox again and it was still too low. They confirmed his saturation wasn't good, 85 at the time, and transported him to Methodist in Richardson. He wasn't allowed visitors because he had COVID. They immediately started him on oxygen. I got a call from a nurse telling me my husband was very sick and his x-rays showed pneumonia. She, she said he wants you to bring his phone so he can keep in contact with you. And I can't tell you enough how important it is that he rotate from his side and stomach and not to lay on his back. I told her I would remind him. I took his phone up to the hospital and he called me at one point and told me what the treatment plan was, five to seven days in the hospital on remdesivir, plasma, zithromycin, steroids. I started crying and told him I was terrified and he said, honey, everything is going to be okay. We talked and texted several times throughout the day, and at one point, he said his saturation was 92. I had hope. My last conversation with him was around 9 p.m. He said, I'm going to try to take a nap. I'll call you in the morning. At 1.15, I got a call from a nurse saying his saturation got too low, so he was moved to ICU on a BiPAP. For those that don't know, it's basically an external ventilator that pushes oxygen into your body. When I hung up the phone, I started screaming and crying, begging God to save my husband. I laid back down in bed crying. At 2 a.m., I got another call from the hospital telling me my husband went into cardiac arrest. They had been working on him for 20 minutes, and I needed to come up there. Remember, I wasn't allowed to see him before, but now that he's dying, I can come. Just let that sink in. I called Kent frantic, and he came and got me. I called Jake, our son. He was on duty in Louisville. We rushed to the hospital. When we got down to the, the ICU hall, we were met by a nurse. 
I'm sorry, Mrs. Jackson, we worked on your husband for over an hour, but he didn't make it. They dressed us in gowns and gloves and allowed us to go into the room. My bigger than life husband of almost 30 years was laying there lifeless. He was still warm to the touch, but gone, pronounced dead at 2.49 a.m. I asked the nurse what happened, and she said he was complaining about the BiPAP. He wanted the mask off, and she told him that wasn't possible. He told her it was drying his mouth out and that he needed a drink of water. She said she would get him a sip of water, but he had to put the mask right back on. He turned her, he, she turned her back to get the water, and when she turned back around, back around, he was unresponsive, and that's when they started working on him. They said he likely had a blood clot in his lungs or his leg that went to his heart. I lost my big brother to COVID on July 4th to COVID, and I lost my husband exactly four weeks later. Yes, I tested positive for COVID, but I didn't get near as sick as my husband. I actually was well enough to take care of him all week, thank God. Getting vaccinated is a personal choice. I get it. The reality is this virus is extremely deadly. It is nothing like the flu. It attacks your lungs, among other things. If you had COVID and it was no big deal, consider yourself lucky. You got a second chance that my husband will never have. Our boys have promised me they will get vaccinated now. Jacob got his first shot Monday, August 9th. Maybe their dad's passing will save their life. In closing, I would like to share that there was a group of us that got all got COVID at the same time. We all tested positive, including my 80-year-old mother. Every one of us that were vaccinated survived. We got, we've had very few symptoms. We did not get very sick. None of us had to go to the hospital. The only one that lost their life was my husband who was not vaccinated. So if that doesn't tell you the vaccination works, I don't know what will. Um, and I just beg everybody, if you don't want to do it for yourself, think about your family, think about your kids, your grandkids. Um, I'm going to see our three and a half year old granddaughter for the first time tomorrow. Um, and she knows her papa is in heaven, but she doesn't understand. And I have to explain that to her. And so don't put your families through what I'm going through. It's a living hell. Please. That's it. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Heather. Melissa, and uh, thank you for your, your heartfelt speech. And You're welcome. All right. Uh, moving to um, housekeeping rules, use chat to ask follow-up questions, mute your phones unless you're talking. No question is off limits. If you don't see your particular question, it may be answered in another question. We had 40 questions and we think uh, many of them are answered and will be answered before we uh, get to them so we consolidated. I will again offer that any of the medical leadership will be happy to uh, answer your questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis if you want to reach out to us. Our agenda is viruses and vaccine basics and how we develop immunity. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the variants and then we're gonna get to the questions. But first, I have a couple of musings that I wanted to go uh, talk about. And like most of my talks, I start with a case. Uh, and this one is in 1981, I was an intern. And during my internship, I saw a young man, he was 18, who had rapid onset of breathing difficulty. He was fine in the morning and by noon, he, he really wasn't breathing. He required intubation. He was biting down so hard, I nearly lost a finger. Uh, and when we finally got the tube in, he was blocking off the airflow and we wound up putting a bite block in, which is a hard piece of plastic and he almost bit through that. No one knew what was wrong from the uh, intern, me, to the residents, chief resident, and even the intending. And he had a sardonic grin, not quite like this, but similar. The next day we were rounding and the chief resident stated that we don't know what's wrong with this man. And the senior attending, the chief, Dr. Olson, 
uh, was on rounds with us and he gib slapped the chief resident. And if none of you know what a gib slap is, just watch NCIS. But it's basically a slap on the back of the head. And he goes, what's the matter with you? Don't you recognize tetanus? And we all went, oh, yeah. And then we realized he had a pistotonus, which is this back arching. You could drive a Buick underneath him. And the point is, we none of us had ever seen the case. And in the 40 years since, uh, I have never seen another case. The disease is almost eradicated, even though the Clostridium tetani bacteria still exists. And the reason is everyone knows that if you get a laceration, a puncture, you step on a nail or do anything like that, you need a tetanus shot, also known as a tetanus vaccination. And these are the diseases that have been eradicated or almost eradicated. Polio, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, chickenpox, smallpox, rotavirus, measles, mumps, rubella, hep A and hep B, shingles, um, not quite, but, and pneumonia, pneumococcal pneumonia. I think one of the, uh, you know, we've seen some measles outbreaks and uh, they were out Midwest where in a university where there were a large number of uh, students that never got vaccinated. And also in Brooklyn where the uh, Orthodox Hasidic Jews live and they also don't get vaccinated. And so, it, the diseases are still there, but the vaccine, the vaccines have made them go away. And then in, um, if you walk around a, a cemetery, an older cemetery, you will see a large percentage of the graves are of young children between three and seven. Uh, starting in the 50s with the polio vaccine, which was what caused most of these deaths, these just stopped. And in the 40s, the MMR DPT saved, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of children. And you don't see this. I mean, we may see a newer one, but, you know, nowadays a young person dying, but it's very rare. And um, it's usually trauma or something along those lines. So if you want to see the success of vaccines, then it's literally written in stone. And the last thing I want to bring up is that people vote with their feet, so to say, so to speak. And over 90% of doctors were fully vaccinated. Now, this article is from June 11th. And... Um, the, uh, you know, between then and now, who knows, but of, of the 4% uh, that aren't, half of them intended to get vaccinated. So I think if, you know, if doctors who went to school and studied this stuff and learned about viruses and learned about vaccines and learned about all this, they're convinced that um, the vaccines work and got 90, as I said, 90% of doctors fully vaccinated, um, I think that speaks volumes. So now we're gonna shift gears and go into some of the science, the, the science of it, um, uh, the virus basics. And I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Dr. James for this. Okay, thanks, Sandy. <clears throat> so, um, today we're going to go kind of in depth, but I thought that was important because I wanted to share what we learned, you know, in medical school, um, a, a little bit about what we learned um, so that you can uh, weed through some of the, the data that maybe you're seeing online. So this is a basic picture of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, also known as COVID-19. This virus is made of proteins and scientists have labeled these proteins and mapped out completely the genome of each variation of SARS-CoV-2. The red in this picture is the spike glycoprotein, which you have all most likely heard about. And I'll explain further in a little bit. There is also an E protein, an N protein, and an M protein, which all do different things. The purple on the inside of this virus is the virus's genetic code, which is RNA. 
Some viruses have a genetic code that is DNA based, but COVID is RNA based, and that'll be important in a second. So regardless of being an RNA or a DNA virus, neither type of virus can replicate without a host. All of them have to hijack our cells and use the organs within our cells to reproduce. The DNA viruses typically hijack different um, organelles, that's what we call the organs in the cell, um, to replicate than RNA viruses. So there's a lot of different types of cells in your body. Each different types of cell looks different under a microscope and you can, as you can kind of see in the picture above. And they all do different things based on what type of cell they are and what organ they're in. The DNA writes it in our bodies for what they do. And regardless of what type of cell it is, most cells in our body basically have the same type of organelles inside that help that particular cell carry out its specific job for your body. Now, how exactly does a muscle cell know to be a muscle cell and know what it's supposed to do? Um, well, that information is going to be encoded on your chromosomes, which contain the DNA. So this little organ here, let me get my mouse, right here, um, that's the nucleus. That's where the chromosomes and the DNA instructions for that cell and all the cells in your body are housed. So what's the difference between DNA and RNA and why should you know or care? Well, because it helps you to understand these variants that you guys had so many questions about and the nature of any coronavirus, um, because coronaviruses are all RNA viruses. So DNA is a double helix, consists of genes and is organized into chromosomes and stored inside the cell's nucleus. The order of the nucleic acids inside DNA tells the cells what to do. They are the blueprint. So you can see over there, the molecular structure, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine in DNA. Um, RNA is a single stranded structure. It is not a double helix. It is made of slightly different building blocks or nucleic acids from the DNA uh, because it has uracil instead of thymine. There are different types of RNA, but all of them are involved in building proteins, which makes your body function. So now just looking at these, which type of virus do you think is more stable? One secured um, by a double helix coil or one that is a single floppy strand of RNA? So if you answered RNA, um, you're right. Um, it is more unstable. These are all the RNA viruses. There are a lot of them. They are less stable than DNA viruses due to that single strand. The 1918 H1N1 influenza Spanish flu was an RNA virus that killed 40 million people in two years. Think about that. HIV, another RNA virus, killed 20 million people in the past 20 years. Unfortunately, RNA viruses like COVID-19 are more difficult to make effective vaccines against, and they are typically the most feared precisely because of their mutations, which allow them to evolve quickly and because of their ability to kill people rapidly. So, and just for completeness sake, this picture is showing all the DNA viruses we know about. In medical school, we had to memorize every one of these viruses in detail. And now you know that each of these DNA viruses have a double helix of information that help them to reproduce. The DNA viruses are more stable due to that double helix. The double helix contains some proofreading mechanisms so that they don't mutate as much. That's a good thing because DNA viruses like smallpox, they stayed stable, they did not mutate. And so scientists could create a vaccine, which really helped to make it extinct uh, much more quickly than the RNA viruses. So now we're gonna talk about how the RNA coronaviruses hijack your cells, reproduce themselves and make you sick. There are multiple stages in a virus life cycle. The first stage is attachment to one of your cells. The virus has got to get inside to those organelles. So here we go. Uh, here's the virus. This line represents the, the outside of any of your, the cells on your body. So it, the virus has to get in there. Um, and every cell on your body contains receptors on their outsides that are involved in cell signaling or communication. So these are the orange ones here. These are receptors, okay? Think of them as cell phone towers. They are hanging out. They're waiting for hormones, 
neurotransmitters, nutrients, and other chemicals to bind to them, telling this cell how to behave or how to function, so to speak. So for SARS-CoV-2, the spike protein, you'll see it on this diagram here in pink, that's going to bind to a receptor on one of your cells. This is important. The receptor that it binds to is called ACE2. That's the name of that receptor that um, the spike protein on COVID binds to. Um, and so you've got the orange Ys, the receptor on the outside of your cell surface binding to the pink spike proteins. When that happens, it's kind of like opening a doorway directly into your cell. Now, not all of the cells in your body have the ACE2 receptor, but unfortunately, many of the cells in your body do. They're located in your vascular system, respiratory system, nasal mucosa, neurons of the brain, nasopharynx, um, stomach, small intestine, colon, skin, lymph nodes, bone marrow, spleen, liver, and kidneys, among others. So once that spike protein binds to your ACE2, right, your cell is going inside. The spike protein is then actually cut up by enzymes. Those are other proteins located um, inside your cell. And upon entering the cell, the process of uncoding happens. So basically that just means the viral capsid is removed and the viral genome, its RNA, that's released. The COVID RNA is represented with the squiggly orange line in this picture. The RNA, the squiggly line, is going to make its way swimming through the cytoplasm to your cell's organ organs um, that we call organelles. So the organelles that they're going to are the ribosomes and the Golgi apparatus mainly. Um, and those particular organs in your cell, those make proteins for your body to function. So RNA viruses hijack those organelles to make new proteins, and those will come together to form baby viruses. These new baby viruses, and I'm not talking about one or two baby viruses, I'm talking about a billion viruses in one human being when you are infected. These baby viruses are then released by a process called budding, or sometimes they just lice and kill the cell. So they just blow up the cell. And they, um, and all in an effort to make their way to other cells in your body that have ACE2 receptors. So I hope that made sense. That's a lot, but I think it's important. So this is more of a 3D representation of the spike protein, this picture on the left. Um, and it's a perfect fit here for your ACE2 receptors on your body's own cells. And again, the cells that have ACE2 receptors make up the organs you see on the right. So this virus, it's just not contained to the lungs, although that, that is the primary battleground. But billions of viruses are going to replicate inside your body until you either die or your immune system fights it off, or modern medicine can help assist your body in fighting off the virus. So we're learning every day how COVID-19 harms our different organs. The lungs are attacked the most, and we don't have long-term studies from the virus to show what type of chronic damage will occur to patients who have had the disease even those with relatively asymptomatic courses. I can tell you my friends in the ER are stunned when um, uh, kids who are unvaccinated come in complaining of like um, abdominal pain and they just happen to get a CT scan on them. The chest x-ray was normal. The CT scan and these kids who got COVID very mild symptoms are showing like COPD type changes. Okay, we don't know how that's gonna affect them chronically. Uh, we do know that cardiac inflammation, heart attacks, strokes, pulmonary embolism, seizures, brain inflammation, kidney damage, and the intestines of our patients, among other things, have been damaged uh, significantly due to the virus. Here's another picture showing viral replication. And I wanna stop here to just emphasize an important point. The RNA viruses replicate fast and due to the single-stranded makeup of that virus, there will be some slight mistakes. We call these mistakes variants. Most of the variants are just duds, okay? They don't infect anything or they don't infect well. But in some cases, the variants are stronger and they bind to a human cells more strongly and they can infect better and spread faster and kill faster. So we're gonna dive deep into those variants in just a bit, but it's important to know they mutate during replication. And so hopefully now you have a full understanding why and how they do that. 
With over a billion viruses and just one individual replicating mistakes, although rare, they're happening. And they happen most often when there are large amounts of viruses spreading in a community. It's so it's trillions and trillions of viruses in that location are replicating and occasionally making mistakes. And you see that here in this graph. Now the Delta variant was first identified in January um, in, in, in India. Shortly thereafter, India peaked. You can see that's almost 400,000 cases a day. Um, each one of those uh, patients producing over a billion copies of this RNA virus. Um, so you can kind of see it's only a matter of time um, where the mutation gained that advantage um, and made, because it was more contagious, it binded better to the ACE2 receptor and it also evaded the immune system better. Um, and ultimately that's what's making this whole pandemic worse. So it's at globally, and it, it's at this point that we are dealing with um, a new virus, kind of, so to speak, that plays by new rules, and we have to learn what those rules are. Uh, more COVID-19 cases reported in the first five months of 2021 than in the whole of 2020. The world is still in the acute phase of this pandemic, despite high vaccination rates in some countries protecting populations from severe disease and death. Inadequate testing and low vaccination rates are exacerbating this disease, um, and the transmission of it and overwhelming local health systems while leaving the whole world vulnerable to new variants. When you look at the original COVID virus, experts have determined that each person infected would infect approximately 2.5 others with the virus. Whereas someone with the Delta variant, they have been shown to infect 3.5 to four other people. It's just, it's simply more contagious. So our immune system uses several tools to fight infection. Your blood contains red blood cells and white blood cells. Our red cells carry oxygen to tissues and organs, and we aren't gonna talk about those cells today. It's our white blood cells that are our real immune cells which fight infection. Different types of white blood cells fight infection in different ways. That purple cell you see um, is a macrophage, it's a type of white blood cell, and macrophages actually swallow and um, eat other cells and they digest germs um, and other dying or dead cells too. So when the macrophages swallow up these germs, they sort of degrade them, chop them up into parts to make them less dangerous. Um, those parts of the invading germs, that's what we call antigens. And the body identifies antigens as very dangerous and it stimulates our B cells, these are another type of white blood cell, to produce antibodies to protect, to attack them. Um, so here you can see B cells actually producing antibodies that attack that pieces of the virus left behind by the macrophages. And depending on how significant that antigen is will depend on if the B cells in your body remember that antigen and for how long uh, so that they can produce antibodies when they see the antigen again. Now T cells are another type of defensive white blood cell. They attack cells in the body that have already been infected. So one good way to think about the difference between B and T cells is that Antibodies made by B cells, they're really good at stopping the virus before they enter your cells. Whereas once the virus actually enters the cell, you need T cells to fight. So this is important because our response to COVID, it's not just about antibodies and getting monoclonal antibodies. You also have to have your B cells and your T cells involved in order to prevent a reoccurrence of infection. So you'll hear a lot about antibodies, um, but scientists are really just beginning to look at the different vaccine reactions and just how they affect your B cells and T cells. Having antibodies alone isn't enough for your body to fight the infection off. Um, and just to relate it to something else, in HIV AIDS, another virus everybody knows about, that virus actually decreases your T cells. And so that's why AIDS patients die of other infections. The T cells are not fighting for them against anything. So they, your cells get infected from whatever, and, and it makes no difference that they have other cells and antibodies. All these components are important to produce a proper immune attack against viruses and bacteria in your body. So, okay, if your head is spinning, that's okay. We covered a lot of complicated information in a short time, but knowing these things puts you at an advantage. It puts us uh, physicians and providers at an advantage to really understand the science behind the disease so we can feel confident protecting ourselves. So here's the whole thing in another picture. We're gonna put it all together one more time. The virus is going into the cell because the spike protein recognizes the ACE2 receptor on the outside of the cell. It binds. ACE2 opens its door, it lets the virus in. The virus uncoats inside, releasing its RNA here. RNA makes its way uh, to your organelles, the ribosomes, 
inside your cell to make new viruses. This happens all over the body and the virus is released from the cell, sometimes destroying it in the process. Our immune system is responding below, okay? Um, the macrophage, a type of B cell we talked about in just the virus, it breaks it up into smaller parts. The T cells signal to other T cells to come eat and destroy already infected cells. Simultaneously, the B cells are coming to make the antibodies against the antigen, which is the spike protein, which will prevent the virus from binding to your healthy cells. If you don't succumb to the virus and you survive, those B and T cells are either gonna stay around for an undetermined amount of time. Scientists are still studying that. They could recognize the virus for months or years. We're working out the particulars of each vaccine and the virus to know if those B and T cells that remember see the virus again, they're gonna attack that virus infected cells and they will give you some protection in order to help uh, you survive. And that's uh, it for virus basics. I'm going to turn vaccine basics over to Dr. Moran. All right, everyone. Everybody remember now why they didn't go into medical school or pharmacy school? Probably. So now that you are all board certified virologists, I'm gonna see if I can make you immunologists. And uh, I say that with a little bit of, you know, comic relief, because I know that this topic is heavy and the basic science of this is not very enjoyable, but I think it's very important because a lot of the things that you're hearing on the news and the stuff that you're seeing on Facebook and a lot of the reasons people are against getting vaccinated is in these things, is in the basic science. It's in the science of how you get sick, how the virus replicates, how the vaccines are made and what the vaccines do. So the, the aim and the goal of this is not for you to be a virologist or an immunologist. The goal of this is for you to be able to um, understand that the person telling you the information or the thing that you're reading may or may not be correct. Um, so we're gonna keep this pretty high level. I know that it's uh, 1048 and I think we've only scratched the surface. Um, what you're seeing on your screen right now are the different types of vaccines. So um, each of these vaccines is made using several different processes and we'll cover those kind of on a basic way. But um, if you've gotten any of the childhood vaccines, um, then you've had vaccines that have been made and developed in multiple ways. And you know our technology systems of, of doing these things has only gotten better with time. So um, this next slide shows the three main approaches to making the vaccine. So uh, the three top circles that you see there, uh, there's the first is using the whole virus or a bacterium. The second is uh, using the parts that just trigger the immune system, which is that outside shell that you see the pointer is, is, is pointing towards those spike proteins. And then the other is to just use the genetic material, which is that RNA or DNA that's inside that double helix that you see there. So those are the three ways that you can create a vaccine. Uh, underneath that, you'll see that if you use the whole virus, you've got three kind of subtypes with using the whole uh, microbiome approach. So you either get an inactivated, you get a live attenuated, or you get a viral vector vaccine. Those are the three things that you can do if you use the whole thing. If you're only using the part that triggers the immune system, which is the subunit approach, which is the spike protein side, then that's the part that's gonna use just those specific parts to get your immune system to trigger the reaction that's required essentially trigger the reaction early so that you have a better chance of improvement. The third way is simply just taking that genetic material and, um, and using that, either the DNA or the RNA for those specific proteins. So let's see, so your next slide, <clears throat> So here's the picture of, uh, of the existing types of COVID-19 vaccines that are available worldwide right now. So these are the different ones we've got out. Um, not, this is worldwide, by the way, not just in the United States, because there are some that we don't have here that are available in other parts of the world. 
Uh, again, live attenuated, inactivated, subunit, viral vector, and RNA. Um, we currently have three FDA uh, emergency use authorization vaccine options that are available. Uh, and you probably have all heard of them. The first uh, is Moderna, which is a RNA vaccine. The second is the Pfizer, which is also an RNA vaccine. And then the third is the Johnson & Johnson, which is actually a viral vector vaccine. On this map, you can see uh, other countries using inactivated vaccines and protein subunit vaccines. And we'll do a deeper dive into those uh, that are available in other countries. But if you, if you want to look into more of that, there's more on the WHO uh, website regarding you know, what's available where. Um, each country, as you know, has its own approval process. So uh, as many of you know, like I'm from Egypt. So in Egypt, they had the Russian vaccine, they had the Chinese vaccine, and they also got AstraZeneca, which was uh, coming from Europe. Uh, they did not have Moderna. I think they finally got Pfizer at some point. They did not have Johnson & Johnson. So you'll, you'll just notice that it's, it's different in different places. Um, but it, here you've got three options. So here's a big topic, right, on FDA and the FDA approval process. And a lot of folks feel like, you know, they don't trust the vaccine because it was rushed. And, uh, you know, maybe they skipped some stuff and maybe they didn't do all the stuff that they usually do. Well, you've all heard of the FDA. They are the agency that authorizes and approves drugs and vaccines. And they you know, are globally respected as kind of a scientific standard uh, of vaccine safety and effectiveness and quality. Probably it's a, it's a more rigorous process in the United States than it is in Europe. So you'll notice that Europe has a lot of medications that we don't have here. And that's because they couldn't pass the rigorous testing of the FDA. It's probably the most rigorous of all of the systems in the world to get a drug approved. Um, so here's how it works. Once a promising vaccine is identified, it'll first undergo a ton of lab testing. And that includes careful examination and testing of the vaccine and its ingredients. And then they uh, test the safety of the vaccine and how well it prevents a disease. If uh, positive tests are achieved in the lab, meaning it does well, then the manufacturer can then apply to do a clinical trial. And then the clinical trials are divided up into phases. So those can involve you know, several thousand healthy volunteer participants. Um, it's usually a paid thing. Um, they uh, have a follow up uh, after getting the vaccine to ensure that you know, they haven't had any side effects. And a lot of these studies can last for many years, uh, especially the follow up part. So they may not remain in the trial phase uh, for many years, but the follow-up of the volunteers that signed up is usually for many years to look for long-lasting effects. So phase one is the smallest phase group, obviously, because you're starting, and so you don't want to test a million people to start with. You start with a small group, and that's about 20 to 50 people. Then that looks at safety, side effects, appropriate dosing, methods of administration, and those kinds of things. And so if you pass phase one, you go to phase two. In phase two, they give it to probably several hundred people as opposed to just 20 to 50. And so they try to group those um, participants, right? Those study uh, participants by age and sex and ethnicity and things that they can develop patterns from. And then, um, from there, they do various dosages. They test that on a couple hundred folks. Then they start varying like, uh, you know, medical conditions that they may have pre-existing, different uh, demographic groups. Uh, these are randomized control studies, meaning you show up and you don't know if you really got the vaccine or you got some saline or you got some sugar water. Nobody really knows. Like, you don't know. The person doing the test obviously knows who's the placebo and who got the real deal. So this provides additional safety information on short-term and long-term side effects and risks. 
and it examines the relationship between the dose administered and the immune response. Um, so that's really looking at what does the what does the shot do to the person as opposed to what did it do on the test tube in the lab that got us to this phase. In phase three, the vaccine is usually given to several thousands uh, of people to help ensure that it is safe and effective for broader use. So Pfizer's phase three trial had 43,000 participants. Moderna's had 30,400. The Johnson & Johnson had 44,000. So you can see the ramp up from phase one, phase two, phase three. So this provides the additional information about the immune response in people who receive the vaccine compared to those who receive a control, meaning the placebo, which, is the, which means they didn't get the actual vaccine. So phase four is the, okay, next step, right? One, two, three, obviously four is the last one. And that's where we are kind of in the US now, where they've gone through those clinical trials, they've shown that they're effective, they are on the brink of getting FDA approval. There's um, really phase four is talking about more of the long-term effects of the product and gathering more data on how it interacts with other you know, illnesses and medications that you take and so on and so forth. So that's more of the longer term part. And that's why we don't have the FDA you know, full approval. So. So what's the difference between a EUA, which I'm sure you've heard, emergency use authorization and full approval? Well, it's that an, an EUA is the mechanism to facilitate the availability and use of the medical countermeasures, including vaccines during a public health emergency, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is where we are with our vaccine approval. So 30% of unvaccinated Americans have been reported to be waiting for full FDA approval which is expected in the next weeks to months. We're not really sure how long that's gonna take, but we've, we've said that it, we expected it within weeks to months, weeks to months ago. So we're just kind of waiting for that to happen. Um, we know that millions and millions and millions and millions of people have gotten vaccinated. We're gonna show you that on the next slide, but we're, we're past phase one, phase two, phase three. We're in phase four and we're almost at the end of phase four. And so what was an argument a year and a half ago of, well, they rushed the process and I don't know what it's gonna do and nobody's taking it yet. And well, that's not really the case anymore. Um, so they're basically collecting data on all of those folks that have gotten vaccinated, which now is 168.7 million people that are fully vaccinated. Fully vaccinated, meaning they've had two doses and they're past the two week mark after the second dose. Um, so, so that's a lot of people. That's the biggest study that's probably ever been done in the history of man uh, before something was FDA approved fully, okay? So I, I don't think that the um, discussion point, I won't even call it argument, the discussion point of not enough people have had it yet, so I'm not really sure if it's okay. I don't know that that's valid anymore because now you've got 357 million vaccines that have been given in the US. And I say 357 because a lot of these are two, you know, two part vaccines, right? So Moderna and Pfizer are two shots a month apart, whereas the Johnson & Johnson is a one shot. So that's a little bit over 50% of the US population has been vaccinated. And now I hope you know a little bit more about how that works. Dr. James. Okay, uh, I am turning it over to uh, Dr. Gorman uh, now. You ready, Jerry? Yep, all right, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, uh, so US is, uh, Adam mentioned we are in phase four for three vaccines that the U.S. are using. So you've all heard of Pfizer, Moderna, and the J&J. &J. Um, the Moderna and Pfizer, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I think it, it demonstrates kind of the technology that Liz was talking about. The RNA vaccines are Pfizer and Moderna. 
those also are the ones that have two doses. Uh, so basically what you're doing is taking just the part of the strand of the mRNA that, that codes for the spike protein. You're infusing that into the vaccine that you get injected with so that the cell produces that spike protein so that your body can produce an immune response, both antibodies and cellular immunity, those T cells, uh, against it. And if you kind of delve down into the pictures, it kind of it demonstrates that. So Moderna and Pfizer are using RNA vaccines, and the j and &J is using a DNA viral vector, an adenovirus. Uh, and again, you're just taking the segment of RNA in, in infusing that into this basically virus that's the vaccine and it goes into your muscle cell, produces this spike protein on the top of the muscle layer. Antibodies are produced, your cellular immunity is produced and obviously on your next exposure to COVID or that spike protein, you're able to generate an immune response. So that's kind of in a nutshell how, how these work. And again, the J&J &J is just the one, is the one dose, the Moderna and, and Pfizer, which are the RNA viruses or RNA vaccines are two doses. Um, and yep, you can go, you can go back. So the first mRNA vaccines, coincidentally, are, are these two, uh, at least used on a, a wide scale. Uh, Moderna has kind of used this technology in other viruses uh, like Ebola and, and so forth. So this technology has been around uh, for well over a decade, but it's really uh, been kind of a, a modern day miracle the way they've uh, honed this technology. Uh, to on a widespread scale where you have millions and millions, literally hundreds of millions of these doses uh, produced in such a short period of time. Okay, so this slide kind of gives you an idea of what is going on, where a vaccine is being injected, these vaccines are injected uh, IM intramuscularly within the muscle itself. Basically, this is to point out because there's been a lot of um, false um, kind of narratives out there that people say these viruses are going everywhere. They're going into cells all over. So this is this is studied. We're during vaccine development. And what this uh, slide actually shows is where, when we inject this vaccine, where does it go? Um, and essentially what you're seeing is that it stays where it's injected, okay? In, in the muscle, and then your immune cells will um, propagate, proliferate into the lymph nodes where they generate an immune response. So th this can actually be tagged. They inject you, they tag you um, with kind of fluorescent uh, dyes that, you know, if you volunteer for this to see where this vaccine goes, to see, is it going to the heart? Is it going to the lungs? Is it going into your intestines? Or is it staying where it's injected? Um, so these are, this is studied. I think this is an important, point to, to make to people who are maybe somewhat hesitant on the fact that they've heard that these vaccines go and disseminate through the body, uh, just not true. Uh, this is studied, this is studied uh, continuously and it stays where it is injected here. And then some of these slides tell you where, what kind of um, immune response you get to it. And that leads us now to the Delta variant and what variants are. And I'll hand that over to you, Liz. 
Okay, I'm gonna hand it to Dawn Patterson. You ready? Hi, thank, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so the Delta variant, it's all the topic right now. And so exactly what is a variant? Remember, uh, like Dr. James said, the virus is rapidly replicating. So it's a mistake that's made in the DNA. I kind of think of it as a spinoff or a newer version of the original. Um, the Delta variant is, is kind of one of those variants. And right now, uh, it's the one that has emerged to be. When, when people are talking about COVID, like Dr. Gorman said previously, 90-something percent of the cases, right now they are talking about the Delta, var the Delta variant. Um, but it's just one of the many spinoffs that can happen. And I want to take a look here and, and show you on this demographic, this shows 16 different variants that we've had just from July the 31st. And the CDC tracks them using information that they get from our local health departments that all around the country. And you can see in the beginning, the alpha strain was pretty much dominant. And then from May to July, you start to see less of it. You see the darker orange, there's the Delta coming on, on the scene basically. And quickly, because of the rate of its, uh, the way it spread and the, and the changes that were made in its, its makeup, uh, when it made that little mistake, when it replicated, it makes it become dominated. And the reason is because it's more infectious. Um, so, so given how well the vaccines were using against real data, working against the Delta variant, so, so how well are they working? First of all, I wanna kind of address the question, some people say that the Delta, variant was made because of the vaccines. I kind of want to back up and, and, and give you the reasonable timeline so that you'll see that that's not really a possibility. Um, really, Delta variant was first noticed in India, and that was back in October of 2020. Now, keeping in mind, the first vaccinated individual in India wasn't until January of 2021. So that's three months after Delta was first identified. So, so it's, it's not a possibility that the, the, the vaccine caused it. Virus mutations happen to occur in, in areas and countries where there's not a high vaccinated rate. There's a large number of people that are in small confined areas. They're meeting together or in a confined area. So that's how most of the, the variants occur. So in moving on with Delta, now we know that mutation, it allows the virus to bind more easily to our cells. And that mutation also helps the virus avoid some of our immune cells that would normally fight it by allowing it to kind of sneak around those reactions that, that the prior um, brought about by vaccinations or any of our prior exposures to it. It changes it just enough that those infection fighting cells, they don't recognize it as well. And that's why it's taken over. The other thing is, like Dr. James was talking about the viral load, when it replicates, it replicates itself to such a large number inside the body the Delta is giving a higher number of that. So when we talk about variants, should we be concerned about other variants? Absolutely. We're gonna to have to contend with a lot of variants until we reach that term you've all heard, herd immunity, or where we have enough cross immunity so that the mutation is not happening as rapidly. And we've already started to see these come on. The fear is that eventually a mutation could render one of our vaccines much more or less effective than it has been. Um, for instance, another variant that will start to come onto the scene and you'll start to hear about is Lamba. Now, they identified it in August in Peru of 2020, or, or Peru, August of 2020. But in recent months, you'll, it started to grow in the, in the eastern area, Argentina, Chile, Colombia. And it's been identified in the U.S. So far, Delta is remaining the, the dominant one and, and Lamba hasn't been able to gain traction yet. But we may very well see a kind of a double onslaught in our country that we've been warned about that's happening in South America. Uh, there's some research that suggests that the Lambo variant uh, may actually decrease the ability of the vaccines antibodies to be able to fight off the, variant, the virus. But the data is limited and we still just don't have enough concrete evidence to say whether the vaccines won't work against the Lambo. But that's always a fear that eventually it will evolve into something that we have problems with. So when we look at how well vaccinations are working against the Delta variant, we look at a few endpoints. We look at infection, we look at hospitalization, and we look at death rate. So infection, you know, this means that the vaccine, whether it prevented the individual from being infected or prevented them from spreading the disease to someone. In hospitalizations, this means like did the vaccine prevent serious complications that round up in the, the patient being hospitalized 
having to have ventilation or organ failure. So patients that aren't fully vaccinated versus those that are, and when we look at it, they have an eightfold increase in the risk of being infected with a Delta variant. Now the kicker is that when it comes to hospitalization and death rate, what you see is a 24 to 25 times more likely for an unvaccinated individual versus the vaccinated. This is where they talk about the vaccine might not be as protective, protective against you catching it, but in the serious effects of it. And that's not as great as it used to be before Delta came along. So, but there's still a good significant difference. The vaccines prior to the Delta were being reported as being 90% effective against becoming infected with the virus. So you can see how that one variant changed. We go from 90% effective against being infected with it. With a Delta variant, we can be affected, but we're infected, but we are not to the severity of hospitalization. So after the variant, the efficiency dropped to 70% against becoming infected with the virus. So now looking at the different vaccines, so are there significant differences depending on which one you received? And this has been studied and the information I'm about to quote comes from studies that are coming from the UK, Canada, Israel, and Scotland. So in England, the Pfizer vaccine was found to be 33% effective after the first dose in preventing symptomatic variant infection and about 79% in terms of being effective after the second dose of the Pfizer. The Canada, Israel, and Scottish studies showed between 64 and 87% effective in preventing symptomatic infection from the Delta variant. The UK and Israel studies showed an efficiency of preventing hospitalization and death, those serious consequences of 96 and 93% after 96 of the first, 93 after the second dose of the Pfizer. So Pfizer is still exceptionally good at preventing hospitalization and death, even with the Delta variant. So now with Moderna. So there was a Canadian study that showed after the first dose, there was a 72% effectiveness of preventing infection and 96% effective in preventing hospitalization and death. So Moderna is still exceptionally good at preventing the hospitalization and death. J&J does not have any studies specifically looking at the Delta. But what we can extrapolate from other studies is that we know that there was a study using J&J amongst the worst variant at the time, which was a South African variant. So when they tested the antibody response of Delta response, they found out that the J&J antibody response was actually better than the Delta variant. So we know that no one was hospitalized or died 48, 49 days after being given J&J in that study. So now for the anecdotal evidence. The ICU physicians around the country and what we're seeing in the ER is that most of the patients in the ICU and having to be hospitalized are unvaccinated. Now they're currently younger this time around like Dr. Murad talked about and, and they're mostly not vaccinated. So more patients without comorbidities are getting sick and these patients are declining and dying and on the ventilator more rapidly than were previously. So the data out of the UK shows us also that there's a 1.85 times more hospitalization rate in the Delta variants and that they have higher viral loads. So theoretically, the more viral load, the more they have the cytokine storms or the bad effects that we talked about earlier. In January, the first peak in ICUs had the nursing home patient population. If you remember that first wave, it was all the elderly. Those were the ones that were having the bad effects and those that were the ones that were dying. Uh, but those populations now are really highly vaccinated. And so that's not what we're seeing this time in. The bottom line is that we have to be, have an honest conversation about what we can do to make sure that ourselves and our families are, are protected. Um, your risk of getting the Delta variant is going to depend on a few things. Are you vaccinated? What is a Delta doing in your community? How prevalent is it? Are you taking risks by going to crowded places, not masking, being in public? And as, as we go into the fall, we need to be prepared because there's gonna be a change in humidity, a change in daylight hours, and therefore change in the vitamin D production. People will be spending more time indoors than outdoors, so there'll be an increased risk for it spreading during that time. So this chart's from the CDC, and it shows six states and the number of cases of the first recorded case. So you can see all of these states are starting to peak again for a second wave. The more infection means the more virus is being replicated. Those mistakes, as Dr. James talked about earlier, so remember, she said too, there's a billion viruses in each individual and they replicate with mutations that cause them to be more infectious, more contagious, putting more people in the hospital. So 
So anywhere there's a population with raging infections, you have an increased risk for new variants developing. And that is what we're afraid of. So the big question, what do we know about the Delta variant in children? Well, we do have a study, it's called REACT-1. It looked at this, and now it's yet to be peer reviewed or fully vetted, but there are a few interesting things that are coming out. So you can see in the highlighted area above that those ages five through 49 had two and a half times higher prevalence of the Delta variant compared to those ages 50 and above. And so when it's possible that, you know, it's the people 50 and above are more, more likely to be vaccinated, that may be part of it, but there could also be a connection between the change in this variant, that little mistake in the mutation that could have made it more, or could have made it where the younger age individuals are more susceptible. We just really need more data and more research to know which of the two of it is. If it's the vaccination protecting the older folks, or if it's the younger people just becoming more susceptible. So throughout much of 2020, our parents were able to take a little comfort in a silver lining of the pandemic, is that the virus seemed to spare young people. Uh, particularly children and toddlers whose symptoms were considerably milder if they had any at all. Um, the pre precise reason for this was never really quite clear. You know, there was a theory that maybe children had fewer receptors that could bind to that and become infected with the virus. Um, some of them wondered if kids just had better immunity because they're exposed more frequently to other coronaviruses, like in the past, the runny noses and the colds before it mutated. The children were also less likely to be burdened by the kind of underlying health and, and, and conditions that plague adults. So they had less comorbidities is why we initially thought that children were doing better. Um, but what's unclear is that more children are getting infected, or what is clear is that more children are getting infected with Delta. And as the more children get infected, you're going to naturally see more children get hospitalized. Pediatric hospitalizations today are really on par at the high of the pandemic of last year. Now, it's possible that the Delta, Delta variant is just so transmissible that the children are facing repeat exposure. The more you're exposed to it, the more likely you're able to get or likely that you are to get a severe case of it. But it's also possible that the people have grown more careless, less masking, less social distancing, or we're not doing virtual anymore. All of this leads to more questions and really more data and more study is needed. Dr. James. Okay, thanks, Don. So now we're going to move on to the submitted questions um, uh, for our town hall. Dr. Murad. Hey, sorry, I was uh, <clears throat> I was in the, the chat function trying to answer some questions. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, do that and try to unmute yourself all at the same time. I am not as fast at this as I wish I was. So here we go. Do I need a booster? Well, let me tell you, that answer has changed already this week. So on July 8th, the uh, CDC and the FDA put out a statement. And basically it was, if you were fully vaccinated, you didn't need a booster at that time. That was on July the 8th. And they were all kind of looking at whether or not this was going to be a thing. Now, we have seen uh, recommendations come out uh, from the White House and on a state level, even here in Mississippi, that says if you are immunocompromised, um, then, or you've had uh, you know solid organ transplant, there's a bunch of different criteria, then yes, you should get a booster. And, um, and I think that's going to be a thing. I really do. I think that we are probably all going to get recommended to get boosters at some point because the longer that this pandemic goes on and the uh, immunity that we have from the vaccine starts to wane and decrease and lessen, then uh, the more important it's going to be to get a booster. Um, there is uh, something called immunologic aging, which basically means that... Uh, you know, you have like a physical age and a mental age, right? Uh, so this is a little bit different. This is immunological age, meaning your immune system changes as you get older. So if you're 30 years old and you got the vaccine, it's different than if you were 80 years old and you got the vaccine. The immunity that you get from that is different. Um, this goes back to some of the questions that we got in the, in the text chat that uh, like if you've had COVID and you've got antibodies, aren't you okay? Are, are you good? Well, that's kind of the same idea as this. I've gotten the vaccine. That means I've got antibodies. I should be good. But 
we don't have a very good way to quantify the amount of antibodies that you have. So when you get the test, it says you're positive. It doesn't say you're positive and you've got a thousand copies or a million copies or five copies. So you don't really know the strength of your immunity at that point. But what we do know and what we can guarantee from science is that over time, that immunity wanes, those antibodies drop off. And what's the critical point of you've got antibodies, but they're not enough to actually help you if you were to get reinfected or re-exposed? That's the part we don't know because we don't count them as one, two, three, four, five, six. We just say it's there or it's not. So um, keep uh, stay stay tuned. I think the booster thing will be a thing and um, and it will, I, I think what they're doing now is they're trying to do studies to figure out at what point the immunity wanes enough that, that you really do need a booster. But I don't know that it's going to be across the board for all age ranges because there is this part of complexity that is the, the, the aging perspective on how people's immune system reacts differently and wanes over time. Hey, Dr. Murad, I just want to add that late last night, the White House press came out and said that, um, so this changed <laughs> as of last night, that they're going to, so I didn't have time, but they're going to uh, probably release a, a statement on boosters sometime today or in the next couple of days. What they have leaked or think is going to happen is that uh, vaccines are, are going to be um, available in September uh, for healthy people. That's what we think. So should have more information maybe today. Uh, Dr. Gorman. All right. Why, uh, why is the J&J &J vaccine still being given? Uh, because it's a very effective vaccine. Um, yes, there are uh, side effects as there are side effects with anything. But uh, the risk of the blood clots and low platelets is exceedingly low. Uh, furthermore, your risk of a blood clot if you get COVID is much, much higher. Um, and the magnitude of probably over 100 times higher uh, if you get COVID uh, as opposed to getting the J&J &J vaccine. So it's still a very effective vaccine, effective against variants, et cetera. So it, uh, and it's, uh, it's a one shot deal. So you can vaccinate a lot of people quickly and effectively with it. Don? Yeah, so I received the J&J &J vac &J vaccination um, April the 12th of the 20, of 21, and I've heard that it might not cover the Delta variant. Um, so, so really, we don't have any evidence saying that it, it's not effective against the Delta variant. Um, in fact, there's just some opposite. There's actually a, a study now internationally, it's in phase three, that's showing that the J&J &J vaccine efficiency is actually at a high rate, around 85% or so, I guess, becoming infected with the disease uh, within about 28 days of administration of it. As of late July, we've seen a large increase in cases in Memphis. After speaking to someone who works for the health department, they're also seeing an increased number of hospitalization of vaccinated patients who have been hit with the Delta variant. We know that Pfizer and Moderna seem to be better handling the variant, but are other areas trending up when it comes to the Delta variant um, being more harmful even to those vaccinated, or is it seeming more localized? Are those with the J&J &J vaccine truly more susceptible? And with the low rates of vaccination in the South, even if vaccinated, should we revert back to our most cautious practices from when we were at the height of the pandemic? Well, number one, the Delta variant is trending up everywhere. It's not, a, it's not localized to uh, Memphis or to Tennessee or even to the South. It's just that we're seeing more hospitalized cases and it all has to do with the vaccinated levels, uh, vaccine, the vaccine levels. Even those vaccinated, yes, we're seeing some hospitalizations, but really not that many. I mean, you, you keep hearing that 90 to 95% of the COVID patients that are being admitted to the hospital that are in ICUs and are on ventilators, they are mostly 95% are non-vaccinated. Of the, of the ones that are vaccinated, many of them have comorbid uh, conditions, um, but 
it, it's it's not like there's a huge number of admitted and hospitalized patients that have had the vaccine. We already talked about the J&J &J vaccine being uh, very effective against the Delta variant. And the third one is, oh yes, with the low rate of vaccinations everywhere, um, mask, um, avoid um, uh, large crowds indoors. If you go to a supermarket or, or whatever, I would definitely recommend masking. Um, hand washing, social distancing, whatever you can do, um, because it's out there. You know, we know that people who are asymptomatic are still spreading it, and um, you definitely, definitely need to uh, need need to do all those kind of uh, precautions that you took because we are at the height of another pandemic. Next. The CDC has some amazing COVID data trackers um, and total deaths, both trending up. You can look at the death rate per thousand by state. We already showed um, a, a graph with the states that we're in, Florida, Texas, um, Mississippi, Tennessee, New York, and Pennsylvania. And uh, you can see the uh, death rate and you can see the hospitalization rates. Adam. I'm fully vaccinated, but should I continue to wear a mask indoors? So the simple answer to this is yes. Um, it's more complicated than that because I, I'm sure that there's a lot of people out there that are thinking, well, I got the vaccine. Why did I get the vaccine if I still got to do all the same stuff that I did if I wasn't vaccinated and before we had the vaccine to begin with? Now I got to wear a mask and I got to social distance and I got to do this and I got to do that. So the purpose of the vaccine is not to keep you from getting COVID. The purpose of the vaccine is to keep your body from reacting hysterically to COVID. Okay, it's to keep your body from freaking out and shutting down your organs when you get COVID. It's to keep you from dying from COVID. It's not to keep you from getting COVID. So these measures are meant to keep you from getting COVID, right? So putting on a mask, social distancing, um, all of that stuff was aimed at trying to prevent the transmission of COVID. Unfortunately, the vaccine has nothing to do with the transmission of COVID. The vaccine has more to do with your body's response to COVID, your immune system's ability to overcome COVID and not have the uh, cytokine storm that makes everything go bonkers. So if you, if you live in New York, where the population is mainly, mostly heavily vaccinated, you're at much uh, lower risk of having a problem. If you live in Mississippi, where the vaccination rate's 35% and the <laughs> and the mask rate is 0%, we are 100% unmasked and 33% vaccinated, then, uh, then yeah, you probably need to wear a mask if you're inside because uh, odds are somebody around you is highly likely to transmit the disease. And they may be lucky enough that they're not that sick, but nobody really knows how lucky they are uh, until they get it and then they have a bad outcome. So, um, so that's really the idea here. The next chart is talking about the unvaccinated versus vaccinated cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. So, so this is the chart you pull out when people say the vaccine doesn't work, because this obviously shows that people that did get vaccinated did not die nearly as much as the folks who didn't get vaccinated. Um, there, we've had a lot of anecdotal cases of patients that got admitted for things have absolutely nothing to do with COVID. Uh, cut their foot with a piece of glass, uh, got an infection in their toenail, uh, got into a car accident. And because the hospital procedure is that you swab everyone for COVID, we have tested people uh, that, had that had been vaccinated that tested positive for COVID. But guess what? They weren't short of breath. They weren't on oxygen. They weren't dying. They were here for completely different reasons. And that means the vaccine works. That's the whole idea behind it. All right. 
When do you think the offices will reopen? Will I be able to return to the office if I am not vaccinated? Um, the actual opening, I'm not 100% sure of, but you will need a vaccine to return to the office. There was just a memo uh, that was sent out, I believe, if not this past week, maybe the week before. Dawn. Yeah. Um, so the next slide in question is Can I go back to that because I think it's I, I just think it's important. I had I wanted to just add this. Um, so um, in an additional kind of unprecedented show of uh, uh, support, um, more than 50 of the nation's leading medical societies published a joint statement recommending vaccine mandates for all healthcare workers. Given healthcare providers' common commitment to first do no harm, it's inconceivable that so many respected medical organizations, including the AMA, the AAPA, the American Association of Nurse Practitioners, which subsequently expressed their support for a vaccine ma mandate, and the American Nursing Association would have taken this dramatic step if there were significant safety concerns. Um, for the vaccine. So I just think that's important to, you know, to show, to, to talk about those organizations as well. Okay, so I'm immunocompromised. Will the COVID vaccine help me? Absolutely. Um, in fact, it's even more important if you're immunocompromised that you get the vaccine. And as Dr. James, I believe it was mentioned, um, just this past week, the CDC has recommended that anybody that's either moderately or severely immunocompromised have that booster dose of either the, the Pfizer or the Moderna um, after, after completing their series. So, you know, more, da more available data will show, you know, these people don't always build adequate levels of protection after their initial two doses of the vaccine series. And so, you know, they, they may benefit from having that third dose um, to help develop as much protection against COVID-19 as they can. But always, the disclaimer, always check with your, with your specialist, your doctor, to, or your specific condition, because there are different recommendations for different people. Okay, will masks be required in the office regardless of vaccination status? Um, because we don't know when the offices will be open, that's still TBD, we will probably determine that answer to that question um, using the available data on masking at the time uh, when those office uh, dates are set. They could, everything could change. You never know. Dr. Moran? Recently, the CDC uh, stated even if fully vaccinated, if there's an exposure to a suspected or confirmed COVID person, you need to quarantine for three to five days and test negative before coming out of quarantine. Isn't this the same recommendation from the CDC for those that are not fully vaccinated? No, <laughs> it's not. So uh, it's a little bit different. So if you've been in close contact, meaning within six feet for a total of 15 minutes or more in a 24 hour period with someone who has tested positive for COVID-19, unless you've been fully vaccinated, um, I'm sorry, I, I got brain fog. <clears throat> so people who are fully vaccinated don't need to quarantine after they've been in contact with someone who had COVID-19 unless they have symptoms. So if you're fully vaccinated and you've been exposed, you don't need to quarantine unless you have symptoms. Um, you should get tested three to five days after your exposure because even if you don't have symptoms, you know, you could still be carrying the disease and could infect others, shedding virus. Um, you should also wear a mask in public uh, during that time period until you test negative. Okay, this is there a vaccine that is more superior to the other? Uh, not exactly. I, I think whichever one you can get and get most expeditiously, if you have not been vaccinated, get that one. 
Uh, the caveat, I suppose, would be if you are of childbearing age and years that you may want to just stick with the Moderna uh, or Pfizer uh, instead of the J&J. &J. Uh, but overall, uh, get the one that, uh, that you can. Okay, so which of the three vaccines is the most recommended one to receive? Again, I agree with Dr. Gorman, uh, whichever one you can get. Um, if you know it's going to be a hardship and it's going to be difficult for you to go back in a month to get the second dose to fully complete that series, uh, then J&J &J is your option. Again, with the caveat that Dr. Gorman said about the women of childbearing age. And I think it's interesting to, to point out here, when you're in a study or when things are under investigation, any kind of an event that happens has to be reported and studied. And they have to say if something happens in that situation or they see a trend. The clots that were referred to earlier do happen more commonly in women of childbearing age with or without the vaccine. So later there'll be a study to see if there's actually a correlation or if that's just a, you know, a by the way finding why they did that. But just to be on the safe side, women of childbearing age should probably not take J&J. &J. Well, the third dose or booster vaccine be effective toward the Delta variant? And the answer is really most likely. Um, Moderna is in their phase two trials with their vaccine booster. Pfizer announced they're developing a booster intended to target the Delta variant specifically. Um, researchers and health officials have been monitoring the real world performance of the COVID vaccines to see how long protection lasts among vaccinated people. The vaccines authorized in the U.S. continue to offer very strong protection against severe disease and death. I mean, we know um, we know that most vaccines um, we don't know how long their protection really lasts, and just because you can't have detectable um, antibodies doesn't necessarily mean that the vaccine isn't working either. I mean, you, you, nobody knows how long a tetanus shot really lasts. Uh, originally, it was every five years, then it moved to every 10 years. We don't know how long it, it's effective against the disease. Um, and, and so I have a feeling that we're not going to really know how long, you know, you know it, it's 18.2 months before the, the vaccine is no longer effective. There's no way we're going to really know that. Uh, but I think uh, the new boosters are going to be directed toward the Delta variant, or they're going to be round three of the same thing. Um, I'm hoping we'll see uh, the, the ones that the one that Pfizer is um, developing that may actually target the Delta variant more specifically. Okay, so for each vaccine, how long are their effective periods? There have been reports that a vaccine is only effective for about six months. So like Dr. Glantz said, it's at no, known at this time. Obviously, the conversation is gaining urgency as we watch Delta variant surge across unvaccinated individuals and um, health officials around the country report low but growing numbers of breakthrough cases in the fully vaccinated individuals, which though they tend to be asymptomatic or mild, they're still of growing concern. The six month drop in efficacy was based on evidence from Israel and its own studies showing reduced efficacy six months after vaccination. The data from Israel has not yet been peer reviewed and the studies from Pfizer, Moderna and J&J haven't been released. Uh, current vaccines are still effective against the variants we are now seeing, um, particularly for protecting against serious illness that would require hospitalization or cause death. Uh, but if the virus evolves further and there's worse variant, the vaccine or boosters could be modified to provide further protection as needed. All right. Is the immune response from having COVID versus the vaccine the same in terms of antibodies? Unfortunately, it is not. So we know that uh, if you've had the vaccine, your uh, body is able to respond and provide the immunologic response actually faster, sooner, earlier in the course of the disease than if you just have the natural immunity antibodies of memory uh, B and T cells. Um, that <clears throat> we know through research that individuals who've contracted COVID prior to the widespread variant have produced antibodies and their antibodies are not as effective on the variant as those who were vaccinated. Um, 
We know that those who were infected will benefit significantly from vaccination because it's basically just kind of re-upping what your body already has seen and, and fought. Um, after receiving the first doses of a Pfizer or a Moderna vaccine, those folks had almost the same level of immunity as folks who had had the two-shot series, had completed a two-shot series and had not had COVID, right? So, so if you've had COVID and you get your first shot, your, pretty, your immunity is right up there with folks who've completed the full series. Now, don't take that to mean that you shouldn't get the second shot if you're in that group. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is you're, you're already kind of at a better position uh, after just having that first shot and waiting that two week period. So immunity from natural infection starts to decline after about six to eight weeks. And, um, and fully vaccinated folks, their immunity looks like it's lasting a little bit longer than that. Um, we, just, we just heard six months and we think it's, it's longer than that even. Uh, but that's why we're now starting to talk about boosters. So, uh, so more to come. Um, how do adverse effects from COVID vaccines differ from traditional vaccines like polio, smallpox, uh, DTaP? Uh, I mean, if you, if you look at um, the chart here or the diagram, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I think all of us who've had it uh, would describe the side effects as um, pretty mild, uh, most likely side effect is pain at the injection shot injection site no surprise there uh i think really that's uh, that was the main thing for for myself some people just get uh diffuse myalgias muscle aches a little bit of a headache um by and large um and this is almost universal it is gone within 16 to 20 four hours. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, I think everyone can speak to it if they've had the vaccine that, uh, all of, uh, my colleagues, myself, uh, it was pretty, pretty easy and, uh, well tolerated. Uh, same with all of my family members, my two of my older kids, 12 and 15 were vaccinated. They had absolutely nothing other than a little soreness at the site. So, uh, it's a very well tolerated vaccine. Okay, so what if you take the shot and you have serious side effects and then what then? So more than 300 million doses have been given. Okay, and out of that, and I'll say this so we can 0.005% have resulted in serious side effects. I think that's really notable. So kind of as a visual to put this into perspective, each of these squares represents 15,000 vaccine doses. And your chance of a serious side effect can be represented by the red mark. So that gives you a visual. It's extremely unlikely that you'll have a serious side effect. Your chances of getting COVID Delta variant and having serious repercussions like hospitalization or death, if you remain unvaccinated, is a lot greater than that mark. <laughs> if I can still spread the virus after getting the shot, how does me getting vaccinated protect, protect others? Well, being vaccinated decreases your chance of becoming infected. So if you have less of a chance of getting infected, you have less of a chance of spreading it. So un, unvaccinated people, as you pointed out, if an unvaccinated person is eight times more likely to become infected and then spread it to all these other people, whereas a vaccinated person um, may spread it to a few people if they get it. Um, so you're, you want to, if you want to protect your family, your loved ones, your colleagues, the vaccine is clearly the way to go. And you can also protect others by all the other cautions, uh, social distancing, wearing a mask, et cetera, hand washing, all very important. It's not just the vaccine that protects it, but if but you are much less likely to catch it if you're vaccinated, and therefore much less likely to spread. Okay. Do we know if the vaccine causes uh, birth defects on potential pregnancies 
And do we know if it causes infertility? And do we know how exactly how it affects a fetus? This is, uh, this one's a little bit even more like touchy for me. And I'm going to tell you why. I had a case here at Anderson this week, young woman, um, 28 years old, uh, second, excuse me, third pregnancy has had two previous healthy children came into the emergency room, short of breath, COVID positive. She was 26 weeks pregnant. Um, they did a, uh, ultrasound, um, for fetal heart tones. And it turns out that she had a fetal demise, right? So the baby died. And so then they had to take her to the operating room to do a C-section because she had had two previous C-sections with her previous pregnancies. So they weren't on, they were not able to induce labor and deliver. So they took her to the operating room. They did the C-section to take the baby out. Um, she was very uh, hypoxic. Her oxygen levels were very low from having COVID and, and her chest X-ray, you know, looked typical. She uh, came to the ICU where I met her that morning on the ventilator. And, um, and I spoke to her OBGYN, who was basically like turning the case over to me because, you know, they basically did what they could do. And her OBGYN showed me the pictures of her placenta from the operating room. So you guys have all heard about the blood clots that are associated with COVID. We've seen lots of patients with clots in their legs and lung clots, right? Pulmonary embolisms and strokes. So just based on all of what you already know about that, uh, just know that you can also develop clots in the uterus and in the placenta. And that's essentially what happened with this pregnancy. The, the patient's body developed clots that cut off the blood supply to the, to the placenta, which is what caused the baby to die. And it also caused all kinds of different clots happening in her body as well. So she didn't just have the clots in the uterus and the placenta, but there were also uh, clots in her lungs as well. And that was contributing to how sick she was and how short of breath she was. I'm telling you this story because this was one of the most difficult cases we've ever had because she's 28 years old. She's got two kids. She just lost a baby and she was on the brink of death. And we did everything we could for her for the next four days. And she ultimately um, ended up dying on Monday afternoon at about 6.45 p.m. Despite everything we did and everything we tried to do for her. And, um, and that's a very long answer to what is a very simple question of there is no evidence to suggest that the vaccine has any potential harm on pregnancy or fertility or the fetus. There is an outstanding amount of information to suggest that COVID can cause death to the fetus and to the mother. That is not refutable, that is not arguable, that is fact, and I can swear to you, I've seen it myself, and the OBGYNs that you will talk to, if you haven't talked to them already, will tell you the same. This is not an isolated case by any stretch of the imagination. Um, this is part of the pathology of this horrible, horrible disease. And unfortunately, there was some information that got put out there uh, that, this, th that these vaccines, not even like a specific vaccine, but these vaccines, which we've already told you, they're different kinds of vaccines. Johnson and Johnson is totally different than the Pfizer and Moderna type, which is different than the AstraZeneca. So, so no one's saying, oh, it's this one that causes this, or it's that one that causes this. It's this general statement of it could cause, you know, problems with pregnancy or infertility or the fetus. Simply not true. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. James was very kind enough to share a lot of other, uh, much more scientific information uh, related to this particular question that, um, that I chose not to read off, quite frankly, because this case has burned a hole in my head since Monday, um, because I started taking care of this patient on Friday, 
and uh, um, and she died on Monday. And it's uh, I to me, I think it, hearing stories of what's really happened to people should uh, should should affect you and should stick in your mind way more than any kind of scientific fact I read off to you, quite frankly. Yeah, I totally agree, Dr. Maud. Thanks for sharing that. And um, just in terms of my scientific information, just in case anybody wants that, the Journal of American Medical Association shows that the COVID-19 virus was found in semen um, and how that affects male fertility, that's still unknown. How it might affect a baby born nine months later, that's also unknown. And um, obviously the impact of COVID-19 on female fertility is a concern. The ACE2 receptor that COVID binds to is ex widely expressed in ovaries, uterus, uh, the vagina, and the placenta. Um, and there was a study out of Wuhan, um, so it's not an American study, but it did show declined ovarian reserve and reproductive endocrine disorders um, in women with COVID-19. But obviously there needs to be further studies so that we can have something uh, more substantial to convince our pregnant um, people to get the vaccine. Dr. Gorman. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this kind of piggybacks off of um what you've all been saying. Uh, the CDC recommendation uh, is that uh, the vaccinations are safe for pregnant people. I think we've touched on uh, the different vaccines um, in which one you may uh, elect to avoid with the, with the J&J &J, um, and choose Pfizer or Moderna, but uh, they are safe and exactly as we had talked about, the, the risks of getting COVID greatly exceed um, any minimal uh, risk of vaccination, even along the, the pregnancy spectrum. Okay, so is there a limit of how many times someone can get COVID and will vaccines prevent second and third rounds? Explanation is not quite all that that easy. It kind of takes a, takes a little further. So. So new variants are always going to be a concern for reinfection because as they mutate, then you've got the potential for that um, mutation to evade the immunity that you have from your vaccine or from the past from the past infections. Um, can you become reinfected with any disease if your body's lost its immunity, like we were talking about needing boosters to that disease? Um, so this is why you can get the flu virus every year. You know, it mutates and your body's immune system doesn't necessarily remember it or recognize it from previous infections to be able to fight it. So theoretically, yes, you can get reaffected with COVID multiple times if these kind of things occur. But really, to truly determine if COVID reinfection has occurred, they'd have to do a genetic analysis of that virus from each illness to kind of prove that the two illnesses were caused by two different COVID-19 infections or two different strands. So bottom line is your previous infection may protect you from getting sick, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't become infected again or spread it to others. Yeah, and, and the thing is, you know, just piggybacking on what Dawn said, the, you know, the, the, uh, when you get infected with COVID, you may develop antibodies to that particular um, virus. But when you get the vaccines, especially the Pfizer and Moderna, you develop antibodies to spike protein, which will protect you so far against all of the variants because they all have the same spike protein. If the if we have a variant that changes the spike protein, that's when we're, we're in really in trouble. Anyway, uh, once an mRNA based shot enters your body, where does it go? Well, we kind of talked about that. Um, it goes into the muscle and stays there, and then uh, it generates uh, and triggers your body's immune response. You start making the uh, the uh, antibodies. It, it it gears up your T cells and your B cells and your, your um, um, megakaryocyte, not your megakaryocytes. Your um, um, I'm blocking on the other the other one that eats the cells. And it the the what's that? Macrophages. The macrophages. Yes, it gears all those things up. And it doesn't stay in your body forever. Um, just like mRNA, when we, when we have normal 
function in a cell and we make mRNA, mRNA to make proteins, you know, that's how our cells work. And then they, they make the protein, then they break down and they reform and they make the protein and they break down and so forth. So mRNA doesn't last a long time in the body. So um, that's why, you know, you're not going to find the mRNA living for 10 years in your body or anything along those lines. Okay. Um, do mRNA and spike proteins accumulate in certain body parts? Okay. This that we, as Dr. Glant said, mRNA proteins do not accumulate in any other body part because they degrade quickly, like within days. Um, we know that. So now in terms of the spike protein, this article um, has been referenced online regarding spike proteins found in the blood of vaccinated individuals. So a key point, obviously, regarding the safety of our vaccines has always been that we don't want spike proteins freely floating around in the blood to cause similar bad effects that the virus does, like in your brain and other organs with ACE2 receptors. So unfortunately, this paper was spun to mean vaccines are dangerous, um, and it's just so unfortunate and misleading to those who don't understand the details within this article. Um, when you actually read the article critically, uh, there are several points about this paper that are very reassuring concerning the vaccine, which is the opposite of what you're saying if you are watching YouTube videos um, that are claiming uh, it's going everywhere throughout your body. You know, so we, we talked about spike proteins. They're produced on the replicating COVID-19 virus. And now I'm talking about spike proteins on the virus, not the vaccine producing the spike. So you know that the virus and its spike protein are traveling in your bloodstream and potentially damaging organs containing those uh, uh, cells with ACE2 receptor proteins on the cell surface, especially your lungs, among other things. Okay, so this is why people are totally freaking out about this particular paper. So what did this paper show when it looked at the blood of 13 people post-vaccination? Their results showed intact spike protein was found in three of the 13 patients' blood samples 15 days after injection. Of those patients, after the second dose, no spike proteins were detectable through day 56 post-vaccination. One person alone had spike protein detected at day 29, which was just one day after the second injection. And when they tested that individual two days later, spike protein was undetectable. That is really reassuring for the vaccine actually. Um, next, um, there has been research done that attempts to clarify what levels of spike proteins like from our virus, from the virus cause the actual toxic effects in individuals who are infected with the virus. Those studies show toxic spike proteins were 40,000. So to get to a level where it's toxic for your organs, 40,000 times higher than the levels found in this study. The assay levels in this study are so small that the others have been, many, many scientists are very skeptical of even the accuracy at this level, at this smallness that they studied. Uh, so again, very reassuring for those getting a vaccine. Finally, you need to know the mRNA in the vaccine contains instructions that ensure spike proteins produced must be membrane bound. They don't freely float around in the blood. Um, this paper is not evidence spike proteins that they found were secreted by the cells that the muscle cells that received the mRNA from the vaccine. The tiny transient quantity found in a few of these patients indicate that actually does not appear to be happening. So in short, this study is interesting, but in no way impugns the safety of mRNA vaccines for COVID-19. Safety of a vaccine must be based on epidemiological surveillance and not one-off studies like this that go viral on YouTube. Data like this must be held in context. And remember the context, over 600,000 Americans have died and the death toll worldwide is staggering, not to mention disabling complications. Some are getting over even seemingly mild COVID cases. Adam? What are the uh, effects of each of the three vaccines that can happen to an individual receiving them, even though there is a rare chance of it occurring? So the biggest ones for the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines is inflammation of the heart. And uh, there's been an increase in the reported cases of myocarditis and pericarditis. And I'll tell you what those are in just a second. After uh, mRNA COVID-19 vaccination, 
particularly in uh, adolescent males and young adults. Uh, so myocarditis is the inflammation of the heart muscle, while pericarditis is the inflammation of the lining outside of the heart. So your heart kind of sits in like this uh, very thin sac, and that sac is pericardium. And so you can get inflammation in that kind of lining outside or the actual muscle itself. These reports are uh, rare <clears throat> and most are mild and uh, people recover kind of on their own with minimal treatment. For the most part, treatment is non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, which is a big fancy word for Motrin um, or ibuprofen. The CDC is investigating to see if there's any uh, relationship between that and the COVID-19 vaccination. The serious side effect of the uh, Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 um, vaccine can occur within about the first three weeks of uh, getting that vaccination. And uh, that, as you've probably all heard, is the uh, blood clotting um, is the biggest one. And uh, that might increase the risk of a rare or serious, you know, blood clotting disorder, meaning you may have something already kind of underlying that you didn't know about that this makes worse. Um, nearly all of those affected have been women between the ages of 18 to 49, who, by the way, are the most, uh, it's, it's the most common age group for a clotting problem. Uh, the disorder happens at a rate of about seven for every 1 million vaccinated. Uh, so when, if you guys remember several months ago, back, I guess maybe in March, when they stopped the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it was because there were six cases out of six million uh, at that time. So this is a rate of seven out of every 1 million vaccinated. Uh, within that age group of 18 to 49. For women age 50 and older, and for men of all ages, the disorder is even more rare. So I just, just to speak about this a little bit, just a little bit more depth here. So we know that women of childbearing age between the ages of 18 and 49, a lot of times are on oral contraceptive medications, which also can make you clot. So they, they, those can cause hypercoagulable states. Uh, if you smoke and you're on birth control, that makes it two times as bad. If you do those things and you get the vaccine, now you're at even higher risk. Um, there's a lot of folks that have genetic uh, inheritable, you know, uh, clotting disorders that they don't know about until they've had a couple of miscarriages and then they go to the doctor and they get checked and they do all kinds of fancy blood tests. And a few weeks later, you find out that you have some kind of a gene mutation. So I, I'm saying all of that to say you have to take that into consideration when you're talking about blood clotting disorders in women between that age group and attributing it directly to a vaccine. Um, the other rare side effect uh, that can come up is uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Guillain-Barre syndrome is an ascending uh, like kind of a paralysis. Uh, happens a lot after viral infections. And, um, and there's some treatments for that as well. There's, uh, we give IVIG, uh, immunoglobulin therapy for Guillain-Barre and uh, the majority of time it, it gets better. Uh, for everything that you could take, whether it's a medication or an injection of any kind, or of course a vaccine, you risk uh, anaphylaxis. So allergic reactions are estimated to occur at about 2% of people after their first mRNA COVID-19 vaccine dose, that's just an allergic reaction, not anaphylaxis. Now, anaphylaxis is the more severe type of an allergic response, and that happens in about two and a half per 10,000 uh, vaccinations. Okay, so will vaccines help us achieve herd immunity now that we know um, we, can, we can spread even after the vaccine? So in most cases, herd immunity isn't really gonna be achieved without an effective vaccine. Um, for COVID-19 particularly, the percentage of the population that would need to be infected to achieve that herd, herd immunity is estimated to be 70 to 
Um, and this is assuming that the immunity lasts um, as long as possible. You know, we, we're worried about the waxing in the immunity. Vaccine hesitancy, new variants, and just delayed arrival of vaccinations for children is really what's holding us back in getting that herd immunity. So additionally, it's still unclear whether the vaccines protect people from spreading the virus to others. Um, herd immunity is only relevant if we have a transmission block, a, sorry, I can't speak, a transmission blocking vaccine. If we don't, then the only way to get herd immunity in the population is to give everyone the vaccine. So long-term prospects for the pandemic probably include that COVID-19 will become endemic, much like diseases like influenza. Dr. Gorman? Yep. Will it be necessary to get the same vaccine type when getting a booster shot? Uh, basically, the, the answer is we don't know yet. Uh, I, I, my gut would be you could probably get any of them. That being said, I, um, along the supply chain, there seems to be plenty of every vaccine. So I don't really anticipate, at least where we are, that that, that being a problem. I don't know about uh, down south. Uh, we don't know yet. There's some basic science uh, research that actually said that maybe varying uh, them could be actually helpful, uh, but um, we don't know yet is the, is the answer. Okay, uh, will the vaccines ever be safe for children and babies? How is the progress for them to, to receive a vaccine? With Pfizer and Moderna, will they be required to receive both doses too? Well, the vaccines for children are in clinical trials and hopefully will be available before the end of 2021. We don't know what the dosing will be or whether they will require two shots and which vaccines are particularly uh, recommended for children. The FDA will move fast, according to the Surgeon General, uh, to evaluate data from vaccine companies once it's ready. Uh, and uh, when the vaccine will be available for kids under age 12 before the end of 2021. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we need to, you know, th this age group makes up a huge percentage of our population. So when you look at vaccine data and you say, well, you know, New York has 70% vax, uh, you know, of their population vaccinated. And then they, the next study says, says 59%. It's those that are including children or not including children. And until we get all children of, of school age to be vaccinated, we're really not going to reach that herd immunity that we were just talking about. And I think we should be able to go as young as six months. I mean, think about all the other vaccines that we give, except maybe shingles vaccine and, and some of the others, but most of the vaccines are given to children. All, all of you that are parents of young children, you know that you get the, the MMR and the Tdap, and these are all done before, before school starts. So I don't expect that we're going to see any uh, difficulty getting these approved for children um, up from six months on up. And I hope we get it done soon. Will every individual have to be vaccinated in order for the pandemic to end? Well, you know, we, we don't really know. Like I mentioned earlier, it's estimated that between 70 and 90% of the population will have to be vaccinated in, in order to, to reach herd immunity. Um, all this, you know, this, this it'll likely be a moving target as we see various stages of the pandemic and with different variants. I'm gonna take this for Dr. Murad. He got called away to the ICU. He's actually on duty today. Uh, with recent studies in the UK and the Cleveland Clinic suggesting that those who have had COVID don't need a vaccination and receiving the vaccine could increase risk of negative effects. How do you see recommendations and mandates moving on from here? Well, a new report from the U.S. Centers for CDC states that those who do not get vaccinated after the illness are clearly two and a half times more likely to develop COVID-19 again. And this reaches the opposite conclusion of the pre-printed study the Cleveland Clinic released in July. The Cleveland Clinic study claimed that individuals who had COVID infection 
um, don't get additional benefits from vaccination. Their study wasn't peer reviewed and it's just a pre-printed study and it couldn't be regarded as conclusive or give clinical practice guidelines, health related behavior recommendations are, are treated as established information. The study didn't really have it adequate adequate support for it. For one, it didn't test people without COVID symptoms, uh, and it only involved a small number of previously infected individuals. So these limitations mean that the study doesn't prove information about how the level of protection from previous infection compares to vaccination and then the potential benefit of vaccination for people who recovered from the disease. But the study also didn't have a context to it. Um, while the study, uh, while they studied the rate of co-infection is one way to understand vaccination, it's beneficial to, to previously infected individuals. Um, but there are also other important factors to consider, such as the duration of the protection, the level of protection against the variants of the virus. But the study didn't look at either one of those. Um, people who had COVID-19 but remain unvaccinated are more likely to develop disease again than those who've been vaccinated. And if they had COVID last year, they probably didn't have Delta. Remember, that just came upon the scene this year. So there's a possibility that people who've had COVID may need one dose of the vaccine, although that issue just needs to be more studied more. I, I, I was unable to find a UK study that served any reference. Gary. <clears throat> Gary. Uh, yep. All right. Uh, if the vaccine is 95% effective, does that mean five out of 10 people more effectively have coverage? Sorry. Uh, or does it mean that the vaccine, those that are exposed to COVID 100 times, you will get five of those, get it five of those times? What does that mean? Uh, essentially, it means that in the trials, uh, the vaccinated people had a 95% lower risk of getting COVID 19 compared with the control group participants who were not vaccinated. So within the trials, you have, say, 1,000 people getting vaccinated, 1,000 people not. And then they compare the rate of COVID um, positive between them. And the people who were vaccinated were 95% less likely uh, under the same conditions, very similar rates of exposure within the community, et cetera, uh, to come down with COVID-19, um, if that makes sense. And I would say that's probably what we're all experiencing clinically um, in our work as well. Yeah, I would say like that for efficacy, for me, the easiest way to remember it is that for every 100 cases of COVID-19 discovered in the group, if they say 95% efficacy um, uh, compared against those that did not have the vaccine, we would expect to see only five cases in the ones that did not have the vaccine. So that's what that represents. And I think a lot of people think 95% efficacy means that 5% of vaccinated people got COVID, but that's just not true. Um, you know, um, the Pfizer and Moderna trials, those who got COVID uh, were about a hundred times less than that at 0.04%. So. Yeah, and you also have to remember your outcome measures are, that's just getting it. It's much less mm -hmm. that you're gonna be hospitalized and even infinitesimally less likely that you're going to die of it. Yeah. I think we bit this one to death. The next one, is it true that the people that have the shot are still giving others a virus because they don't know that we've had it? Um, yeah, vaccinated people with breakthrough infections can spread the Delta variant. Um, there's a difference in the viral load present in breakthrough of infections occurring in fully vaccinated people and the other cases suggesting the viral load of vaccinated and unvaccinated persons infected with the coronavirus is similar. So that was why, exactly why the CDC changed and updated their mask recommendations for those that had been vaccinated. Can I add something just quickly, Liz, on this? I don't know if you've yeah, seen sure, the, go for it. The, yeah. the, the, the data from Lollapalooza where they were they, they about 80 plus percent of the people there. I mean, you had 350,000 people. Uh, I think they had 80 plus percent vaccinated. Now again, whether people kind of falsified that or not, but they've only had, I think 200, uh, with zero hospitalizations from that event. Again, it's younger people and so forth, but I think that again will um, kind of speak to the, to the efficacy of, of the vaccines. If you have a crowd of 360,000 people, 80 plus percent vaccinated, and what are we, a week or two after it, 
roughly 200 cases with zero hospitalizations. I mean, they're following these this out, but that's again very uh, very good data. Mm -hmm. We're almost done. Got three more slides. <laughs> yeah. Can the shot cause problems if you already had COVID? Um, well, remember, if you've already had COVID, there's a chance that you do have some of those antibodies lingering around. And so your immune response is going to kick in faster and kick in stronger. Um, so it's not really anything to be alarmed about. It's actually a, a good thing showing that you're, you're building immunity. That's why a lot of people here who've had it do well with the first shot, but have the, the achiness and the low-grade fever, the fatigue with the second shot. Um, because that's the immune system kicking in, and that's actually a good response. There are two small smutty studies that suggested that people who've previously been infected with COVID might only need a single dose of one of the mRNA vac vaccines, but as it began, you know, produce the large antibodies following the virus after their first dose. But follow-up studies are going to be needed to confirm that, because remember that immunity can wax over time, so time is really going to tell on that one. How low or what are the percentage rates of those vaccinated and unvaccinated in the Keystone office locations? Well, we have some data for Memphis, fully vaccinated is 39%, Tampa is 45%, and but we don't know uh, about Collins County, Plano, um, but we know Texas for, you know, is, you know, their vaccine rates are probably in the low high 30s to low 40% rate. Um, I don't know if that answers that question, but um, clearly, you know, you can look at this map and see where, you know, the low, you know, the red areas, you know, which are high risk and the, and the yellow areas, and they don't have any green ones, but, you know, um, uh, but clearly the, the South, in particular, the whole south, the whole south belt here, is at high risk. And I'll take this one for Hottam. How are medical professionals adapting to the changing landscape of updated information regarding what we're still learning from the virus and the vaccines? And the short answer is we're constantly reviewing information and changing recommendation as new data comes in. I mean, you could hear it in this talk, you know, there, there are, there's data that's coming in almost every day. You know, we've, we've had changes in recommendations coming from, uh, you know, that, that daily or we're getting new reports and changes and recommendations because this is a, uh, we're in the middle of this pandemic. Information is coming in at, a, at an enormous rate, and we have to uh, sift through that information to figure out what's real and what isn't, and how to look at it, and whether it's meaningful or not. Um, but yes, we're, we're, every day we're making changes and recommendations, and so when you hear about flip-flops, it's not flip-flops. It's because the um, because the data keeps changing and we need to keep up with the data. So um, just a couple of quick conclusions and a few thank yous. We're way out of time. And I thank you all for hanging in as long as you did. Um, one or two last points. Uh, first of all, thank you to the medical uh, leadership, uh, particularly Dr. James, who put this whole slideshow together. What an enormous undertaking it was. Thank you, Dr. James, yeah. Dr. Murad, Dr. Dr. Murad, Dr. Gorman, Dawn Patterson. I mean, you guys did a, a phenomenal job. Most importantly, thank you to Melissa, Melissa Jackson for your heartfelt message. Um, and we will, we will um, try and answer all the questions um, on the chat that were put up on the chat. Unfortunately, uh, some of them, I think, had them already tried to answer. Um, and again, for the third time, please, if you have any questions that weren't answered here, or you still have doubts, or you still have anything, please feel free to contact me, Dr. James, Dr. Murad, Dr. Gorman. Any one of us will be happy to talk to you uh, and answer whatever questions that you still have that we may not have answered. 
And with that, I'd like to conclude this meeting. Thank you all for staying through the whole thing. Thank you for Amina for hosting this and uh, good luck and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.